joining us as well on this Wednesday, our resident doctor in the house, getting our minds right for the rest of our lives, Dr. Robin Smith. Welcome back. It's good to be here. Very good to be here always. I miss seeing you and I know that you uh, took some time off when we you know, signed off last time. You were in route somewhere. I didn't have a chance to ask you uh, what you were doing, where you were going and uh, whether or not that's something that you could share. So I just heard yeah, that you yeah, yeah. may tell us. Yeah, no, I am not going to tell you where because I might want to go back and I don't want to see nobody <laughs> so when I go back. But I went somewhere where I had a house with a pool and a, and a beach that was like uh, right there that I got to get up and go to the beach and put my feet in some water, roll my bike mm. out, watch the sun come and go, got in the water, swam, something I hadn't done during the whole pandemic because the gym and people in the pool with COVID just didn't seem to make sense to me. <laughs> I don't care what the research said. I'm like, yeah. But interestingly, uh, Doc, when I went on this trip, people said that they were going to come visit me because some people knew where I was. And I was like, I'm not vaccinated. Well, I'm vaccinated. I'm vaccinated. I was like, but I'm not. And y'all can still be carrying. I, I didn't come on vacation to have a birthday to catch COVID. So I went to the local CVS out of town and got vaccinated. So I did that. So and then that's I big. My second shot. So I'm completely vaccinated. That's big. That's, that's what exciting. Happened. You know what, Karen, is uh, I think a powerful message uh, right now when we are, you know, you're talking about that you went somewhere, but you're not going to tell us where you'll tell us some of what you did, but not where, because you may want to go back. I think it's a beautiful example of a healthy boundary. Mm. And we get very confused. Um, I just did some training today. And part of the confusion is how much do I owe people? How much transparency? Am I dishonest? when I tell a part of the story and not the whole story as if we owe um, the whole story to anyone. And so I think it's beautiful that you are sharing what fits for you and what does not fit because you're protecting the fact you may wanna go back there and you don't wanna have me show up because I am, <laughs> because wow. I have to go where no. you are no. and I like right, to folks. swim and I like the beach. Listen, um, I had the, uh, I guess it was um, the benefit of spending the first part of my career as a journalist. And then uh, the second phase of my career was as a, a ghost writer for celebrities. So mm. I got to be around people who are uber famous. And the conclusion I came to Dr. Robin is I never want to be uber famous. I don't want to be able to go to a restaurant, have people come up to me while I'm eating and bugging out and all of that. I just, I was like, this is not the life for me. You know, like Zsa, Zsa wanted to go into the, I'm good with the farm. So I decided then, and then one thing I, I went to breakfast because I was doing several books with Wendy Williams and I took her to my spot that I love to go to for breakfast. And this chick got on the radio and talked about the breakfast and talked <laughs> about the spot. The next time I went there, I couldn't get a seat. Mm -hmm. It was, let me tell you, and, and I'm like, now everybody's here and yeah. I can't get my food the way I, and I'm not even being treated special now because now it's mm. my spot. So yeah. I was like, eh, no more. I'm not yeah. taking anybody to my spots. Yeah, you learned, you, and that's important. You learned that you have to be careful who you share um, your life with. Yeah. yeah, boundaries. Absolutely. Mm. There are boundaries, if we have two, if the boundaries are too rigid, they are harmful. And if they are too um, flexible, they are harmful. And so we have to find that balance between boundaries that keep us safe, but also don't imprison us. And there's a mm. difference between that. How do we find that balance? Because, you know, um, I, I had to learn the hard way. And, uh, you know, we were talking off mic and I was like, yeah, we're family. And you're like, well, you can't share everything with family. I was like, we also have to define who's family just because yes. somebody's blood relative doesn't make them family. Absolutely. Well, right. no, it, does, it doesn't. I mean, what it means is if they are a blood relative, they are blood related. That is different than family. I mean, family, mm. um, if we expand what it really means to be connected, it means a soft place to fall. It Ooh. means a place where I am not judged or shamed or blamed, and yet I am held accountable lovingly. 
And that is not necessarily what's happening in many of our families. So I think, you know, I, I was talking when, when you just asked the question, how do we create boundaries? How do we do this? I would invite everyone right now to think about how much of your life is based on shoulds. Mm. So I was talking with my partner, this wasn't super recent, but he was inviting people to something. And I said, well, you know, what's having you invite them? And he said, well, because, you know, they were there when something happened in my life. And I said, okay, but does that mean you want them there? Just mm. because someone showed up for us. So you guys know that, or, or you don't know this yet, Tanya, probably, but uh, my mother died. Uh, it'll be a year on Friday, a year ago on Friday. And she, again, was fierce. I mean, fierce. Um, she also could drive me crazy. And again, I've always kept that real. You know, she didn't love that part of it. Um, she loved when I said she was fierce. She loved when I said that, you know, she was amazing and extraordinary. And she was um, a Black woman and one of the first Black women to graduate from Bryn Mawr, which is one of the most elite schools in the country and a lot of great things. But she did not like when I talked about the places where we struggled or she struggled um, with my grandmother who lived to be 108 and a half. Mm. And so I got to watch, I got to watch the, the shackles. You know, some people have to wonder like what happened. I didn't have to wonder because I had my mother living, her sister, my aunt being like little children with my grandmother. And so I watched them shrink. Um, I watched them try to please an unpleasable woman who also was amazing, mm. but my grandmother was tough. And so unless you knew how to have a boundary, not a should boundary, but something that said, okay, how do I keep myself safe? You know, I know that my grandmother will say anything she wants and she didn't do it as much with me, but it wasn't like, how do I change grandmommy? It's how do I change me? <laughs> so that I don't feel obligated to um, like include her if I wanna have complete joy without any criticism about something. So that's my choice. And I think so often we don't want, you know, we're like, well, you know, I'm gonna invite her because it might be the last time, you know, she's there. And people would say, you know, you really should invite your mother. And I'm like, it could be her last, whatever, birthday, Easter. I was like, it could be my last one too. So how do I want this last Christmas, this last Easter, if it's mine? And that's very different. So as we're thinking about boundaries, ask yourself how many shoulds are mm. you living from? How many wow. shoulds, like inviting people to a wedding because I should, inviting people to a graduation because I should, how about asking yourself, if I had no fear, if I had no fear and there was no consequence, no repercussion for not inviting your father, your mother, your grandparent to your wedding or to your bar mitzvah or whatever, would you do it? I, I'm with you. are telling the truth, the answer is there are some people who we have on the list to come that we would not invite. Yes. I will say that one of the greatest gifts for me of menopause is I think something changed inside of me where I realized that the only reason to do or not to do anything was I want to. Yeah. I don't want to. Yeah. And no further explanation is needed. Right. I want to. Yeah. I don't want to. That's that's all. That's why. <laughs> And you know what's powerful about that is that's not denying that that could create pain for someone. It could hurt someone's feelings. The question again is, am I always going to be protecting the feelings of the other? And what about me? Mm -hmm. What about you? What about you? What about everyone who is listening? So is it always going to be about someone else's highest good? Or can I begin on this day, on May the 26th of 2021, can I begin to ask myself, 
what is my own truth? And what, as you know, Tanya just said, what do I want? And what don't I want? 866-801-8255, 866-801-TALK. Tanya Pinkins is here, of course. Dr. Robin Smith, best-selling author, ordained minister, psychologist, and you can follow her at Dr. Robin L. Smith on the Twitters or go to drrobinsmith.com. Sorry, go ahead, Tanya. I was going to say that I remember a moment in my young life when I was, uh, I was in a court and my husband had filed for divorce and I was raised Catholic. So you're supposed to marry and you're supposed to marry once. And when we got to court, um, the judge didn't give him what he wanted. And um, he suddenly went to his lawyer and said he changed his mind. He wanted to reconcile. And the judge turned to me and said, and what do you want, Mrs. Pinkins? And I honestly didn't have an answer. I, I, I said, well, I didn't ask for the divorce. I, I love my husband. And if he wants to be divorced, I guess we'll be divorced. And, and if he wants to stay married, I guess we'll, we'll stay married. I mean, I didn't have an answer of what do I want. I, I don't think I was raised to, to know what to want. I was raised to, to be a good tool and to be a good girl and to build other people's castles. It took me a long time to even think about what I want. <laughs> Mm -hmm. You know, that's also, I think, such a, a wonderful um, personal story because we are not raised, many of us, particularly women, particularly Black women, to think about what we want, um, what makes sense for us. So it can be a, a huge kind of dumbfounding question, like, what do you mean, what do I want? I mean, I want what you want. I think I've told this story, if not on here, um, there's a Julia Roberts and Richard Gere older movie called Runaway Bride. And she is engaged about four times to four different men. And each man she's engaged to, they ask her what is her favorite egg, kind of egg. And she says the kind of egg that that man likes. So if it's scrambled, that fiance, the next person was over easy, the next person. At the end of the movie, she says, by the way, after she, you know, after, after everything fell apart, I learned that I don't like any of those eggs, <laughs> but I learned what egg I do like. And so there is something very powerful about all of the things we have ingested, we've made, uh, that someone else has made us claim. And there is something about stripping all of that away and being able to ask the question again, who would I invite for dinner? And I, I talk about it in Lies at the Altar, uh, my second book about resetting the table. Mm. You know, a lot of times we've set the table and we just assume that all the parties that we always invite, our families, everyone has their, their place at the table, but part of living in the truth and, and living less in a lie and more in truth every day is to reset your own table. And to reset your own table, we have to ask ourselves, what do I want and what don't I want and who do I want and who don't I want? And so there is, it's, a, it's, it's radical. It's a radical liberation, um, exciting and terrifying at the same time to think about the self in a way that we, again, particularly as Black people, have just had no sense of being anything other than the property of someone else for their Absolutely. highest good. Yeah. Yes. I have a and very personal question to ask you. Of course. So I was looking at your book um, and you were talking about hunger yes, and making the good. list about what we hunger for. And mm -hmm. I, I think a lot about that because I know that um, I eat for, uh, it's my, it's my, it's my, it's my joy. Mm -hmm. It's my, uh, it's my pleasure mm -hmm. because the things that I actually hunger for uh, involve other people who I can't control or other things that I can't control. And so, uh, you know, I was like making my list and, and, and I, and I often think, or actually a therapist once said to me that you are eating to try to kill yourself or to kill all those wants that you can't have and you're never going to die from it. <laughs> yeah. But I am aware of this, uh, 
this eating to stuff down, this eating to fill up, but it is not eating to nourish the body. And, and I wondered if you had thoughts about that. Soothe. You're trying to soothe something uh, that actually is asking you for your full attention. Mm. Yeah. I mean, so much of, you know, eating, drinking, gambling, sex, shopping, whatever it is, uh, talking on the phone, working out. I mean, so many of those things are to keep us from ourselves. And your the therapist was right. That won't kill us. What is killing us is the betrayal of the self. So we can't always have what we want or who we want or something the way we want it. But there is something powerful about owning what we want. What we want. Dr. Robin is in the house. Uh, the number here is 866-801-8255. Um, I remember having this conversation with my mother after my father died. And, you know, as I mentioned on, the, on, on these airways with you, she went from her mother's house to my father's house and they were married for 47 years uh, at the time of his death. And she didn't really know what she wanted because everything that she wanted was what he wanted. Hmm. And you know, I was like, to get to a certain age and not ever know what color car you really like or what food you really like, you know, I could never imagine that. But there's so many of us living that way, as Tanya mentioned, because we're raised. And I'm, I'm imagining people listening right now feel like it might be selfish of them to consider themselves first because we are so hardwired, a lot of particularly black women, to put everybody first. So the notion that you're going to put your feelings first is so foreign. How yeah. do we how do we undo that 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 programming? Yeah. Not only are we programmed for it, and then we wonder why our depression is higher, mm. um, and we wonder why our rage is higher, because it is insulting in many ways to our own truth to take care of the whole world and neglect the self. It's just simply what we know how to do, but the soul is not okay with that. And so that depression and the anger are actually signs of healthy rebellion. And hear what I'm saying, healthy rebellion, something that is trying to get your attention and mine to say this combination of always looking out for my mom and sisters and cousins and all these other people, that is not what we were born for. And this is where slavery is, an, it's another one of the many places where it manifests its poison in that we were kidnapped. And, you know, and I always remind people that we were kidnapped. This wasn't like, I'll sign up, I want to go. We were taken. So there's trauma in how we ended up where we ended up. And after we were kidnapped, then our soul, hear this, our sole purpose was to serve someone else, including breastfeeding other people's children, meaning the, the master's children and mm -hmm. not the children you had with him. I mean, that's a whole other thing. That's, those are your children too, but I'm talking about the children that he had with his wife that you are breastfeeding and nurturing and loving on him. We wonder why they run after you and you are the one that comforts them. So if my whole identity was based on service of someone other than me, it is a radical thing to ask everyone right now in this moment to consider what it might mean to put yourself front and center. Do you think that that's passed on epigenetically? This idea that we were, we were quote, bred to serve and now that's epigenetically passed on. Absolutely, I, I am certain. Um, and for people who don't know that word epigenetics, um, I want you know to just break that down. It means that what happened seven or 10 or 12 generations before, is sitting right here in this chair with me right now. And so unless I can uh, put the light on it, I mean, really put the light on it without shame, without blame, 
I cannot extricate myself from something I do not understand. This is wow. fascinating because literally one of my children, you know, wrote me this letter where he described these terrible things that I had done to him. And they were things that were done to me mm -hmm. and they had never been done to him, mm -hmm. but I'm certain that he believed it. And I was just like, is this being passed down some kind of way? And I checked with my other children and I was like, how is, how is he? He wasn't there when it was happening to me, but he's describing my life as me being the per perpetrator. Yeah. Well, and I say, and Karen knows this, that I said, we are all victims and we are all perpetrators. We're just much more comfortable being the victim than we are the perpetrator. I think what is powerful about what you're saying is you may not have done or you did not do um, in, in the flesh, shall we say, to your son what was done to you. That does not mean that somehow it was not transmitted. Mm. So there are people who never raised their voice to their children and yet they were unkind and a parent could say, I never yell at my children. I didn't spank them. I didn't yell at them. I mean, I went to their plays and they're this, they're that. What they do not know is that how detached they were, how non-present, how on automatic pilot, more like a robot than a person mm. can show up in so many ways. And so there are a lot of ways that, that our history shows up maybe wearing different clothes, maybe being educated, maybe mm. even having gone to therapy, you know, and we think we're way woke. And the truth of the matter is there are still great blind spots we bring to the table about what we actually bring to the table. 866-801-8255, mm. mm. Dr. Robin always comes through y'all. Uh, Tanya Pinkins is here as well. And thank you for, for sharing. Let's uh, head over to the phones. Uh, Karina, Karina in Tennessee wants to talk. Welcome to the Karen Hunter Show. Turn your radio down, please. Hi, ladies. Um, so I just had this conversation with my sister the other day. She's been married. Um, she's in the middle of a or soon to be divorced. And she has never put herself first. And I told her, um, you have finally got to take the time to put yourself first. You need to be selfish. And I'm going to play this back for her because I need her to understand this. But I learned the lesson many, many, many years ago from Oprah where she said no is a complete sentence or something like that. So I learned it a while ago before I even had my kid. And he's just so anyway, so I learned it a long time ago. And I've been trying to live it and embody it for her but she's just now getting it. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to play this for her because I think you all just said a word and it's, oh, you just touched me. Mm. Karina? Yes, ma'am. You know, um, and thank you for sharing your story, your journey, the journey your sister's on. One of the things I just want to remind you uh, is that one of the most impactful ways we can reach someone is to consistently and with compassion, live the liberation in front of them. And so I want mm -hmm. to make sure that as you play this back um, for her and what an honor that is for all of us. I mean, that's why Karen does what she does um, so that the word continues to um, reach the world. But I also wanna make sure that when you share it with her, you tell her that you realize what a hard move it is yes. to love to love yes. itself it's so yes. important it's it's not an easy thing when we've neglected ourselves when we've been programmed to consider and think about everyone else it's a big deal and so i just want you to affirm her for taking whatever baby steps she's taking and that i always say it takes what it takes i mean there are things that i wish that i had known before but truthfully if I had known what I know now, I wouldn't be who I am. And so I had to suffer. I had to um, really let things fall apart. And so that when I came back together, what came back was someone very different than the person who left. And so I would also encourage her to know that it's never too late 
um, and that she can work at her own pace to learn the difference between selfishness, because it's not selfish to love right. the self. Yeah. It's actually yeah. self-preservation. Yes, yes. Great. Uh, well, and, and I think- ladies. Um, thank you. Ahead, I'm sorry. Thank you for sharing. No, no, I was just going to say thank you for sharing, Karina. I appreciate that. And I think, you know, I'm not going to speak for Dr. Robin, but I think a lot of times we shame people once we figure something out. Mm. Like uh, when my mother quit smoking and my father was still smoking, boy, she was trying to shame him. I was like, but you were smoking for 20 years. <laughs> I mean, I don't like it. neither one of y'all smoking, but you know, you acted like you weren't also smoking for 20 years. It's like, once you figure it out, you are going to be like, everyone needs to figure it out right now right. and yes. we we yes. wag our finger we shame people into oh i just lost all this weight why you can't lose this weight you know it's like we're all no, that's operating a, in our that's a wonderful point i mean i always say it's you know like just be glad that you got your religion and whatever that is because it is so true that we embrace something and we're excited about it but we can become kind of zealots in a way that hurts people mm -hmm. uh, and certainly hurting someone for struggling, um, hurting someone who does not um, know that they are worthy, I mean, completely mm. and fully worthy, would only reinforce the injury. And so Karen, I love that reminder for us to be tender um, because we did just get our religion, not yesterday, but this morning, and we don't even know if we can keep it through the night. And so, it is so important that we make room for people to be on their journey at their pace. I also feel like for black women, you know, we, we are, we are surviving and we're trying to save our families and we're trying to save our communities. And so there can feel like an urgency that is outside of ourselves that is more important than ourselves. But I always believe that if we, you know, put on our oxygen mask first, then we can be there to save everybody else. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. 866-801-8255. Thank you, Karina. Let's head over to Maryland, Maryland, and welcome in Sylvester. You're on with Dr. Robin. Tanya Pinkins is here as well. Hey. Hey, thank you. Thank you, ladies. I just want to say Karen Hunter be taking us to school every, I don't know what kind of grade I'm going to get this semester, but she be taking us to school. But you I grade yourself you know in my class. You grade yourself. Okay. Okay. So like it's an independent study. I got that. That's right. I'm, I'm right here. I'm right here with you. So listen, so this is also an interesting topic for males as we come up in a, in a household system where, you know, like the grandfather, the father dies early on. And then you take on that role or that responsibility of being the only male in the house and trying to do everything to satisfy grandma and mama and aunties and everything. Then you look back over your life, and you're like, wow, you know, <laughs> how did this happen? I mean, all those people are gone now for the most part. Mm. And you look back and you're like, I did a lot in terms of trying to satisfy other people's needs instead of what my own needs have been. And so listening to you all talk, I just find that topic just very interesting. Just wanted you to, you know, talk on that um, doctor, if you will, like, you know, like from a male perspective. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. And I'm doing some work. Um, my manager, Gilda Squire, um, the one and only who Karen also uh, bows to. The queen. Uh, oh, and she is goodness. the queen. Absolutely. She is the queen. There's no question about that. Uh, we're working on some literary things together. And, um, and I've been doing some writing. And one of the things that I am um, so passionate and committed to is what this means for men as well, because there's a whole angle in which men, black men, white men, men have been, we've told them um, we want them to be the Marvel man, you know, for people mm. who are too young to know what yeah. that means. We just want them to be all that. Um, you know, we want them to be on a, a, on a horse or in a Benz or, you know, whatever that means. And we don't want them to be human. And so when they behave in inhuman ways, mm. we wonder like how, like why, like where are your feelings? But when they were three or four and fell down and their sister was three or four and fell down, we pick her up, we kiss her boo-boo, we tell her, let me get a Band-Aid, let me clean it, let me kiss it. You know, he, we say, get up, you'll be okay. Get up, you'll be, so he's hurt. 
but we made no room for the pain and the ache of that man. And so, and particularly with black men, I so believe that a lot of the gun violence, not the, the police gun violence, that's a whole other issue that we've talked about here, but the black on black violence, some of that to me is because black men have not been able to grieve, mm. to weep, mm. to be afraid um, openly. And so those bullets to me are like tears, but it's just mm. that no one seems to know that each bullet and each death is really the, the, the cry of the mm. soul of black men. And so I really appreciate this um, question, this call, your thought uh, about the ways in which we as women and men set men up um, to remain broken. You know, I mean, not only to break them, but then to remain broken. And it is our responsibility as women um, and as men, but to re-language what does it mean to be a whole man? And for a man to be able to think about what he wants. I mean, so often it's about like, bring your money home. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what, what tuition is due? Uh, what bills, you know, need to be paid? And so where are we seeing him as a human being? So the woman wants to be cared for. She wants you to ask how she's doing. Why wouldn't he as a whole being want the same um, experience of being seen? 